The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jessica Burke, and I am here along with Andy Capehart, and we are with the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, APS TARC, and we want to welcome you to this webinar, Critical APS Partner, Understanding the Aging Network, with our presenters, Carl Urban and Jason Wagner, who I will introduce shortly. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I would like to share a little bit of information. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and is administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide, please. Now on to some housekeeping. In the handout section of your webinar control panel, you will find today's slides. You may download these at any time. Please use your computer speakers to access audio for this webinar. Please make sure the speaker volume is adjusted to your desired volume. If you experience audio problems during the presentation, we recommend that you sign out of the webinar, re-enter, and log back in. Next slide, please. You may ask questions and share comments by typing them into the questions box at any time during this webinar, and we will relay as many as we can during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Please note we may not be able to get to all questions. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the TARC website along with a copy of the slides. We will notify all registrants via email when it is posted online and announce their availability more broadly through the APS TARC outreach channels. Everyone attending today will receive an email approximately 24 hours with the link to download your certificate of attendance. CEUs are not offered for this webinar though. And be sure to take the brief eval survey when prompted. We always love to hear your feedback. Next slide, please. Now I would like to launch a quick attendee poll so that we can get a sense of who our audience is today. I'll launch that poll now. So our question is, what profession do you identify most with? Single choice answer, adult protective services, medical, legal, other social services, or other profession. Give you a couple seconds here. <clears throat> Leave this up for about 15, 20 more seconds just to make sure that everybody has an opportunity. So again, what profession do you identify most closely with? Adult protective services, medical, legal, other social services, or other profession? Andy, let's go ahead and close that poll. So it looks like 76%, so three quarters of our audience today is from Adult Protective, Adult Protective Services. We don't have anybody in the medical. Uh, legal, 3%, other social services, 20%, and other profession, 1%. Thank you for that, Andy. Let's go to the next slide. So it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. First, I would like to introduce Carl Urban. Carl is a senior research manager with the APS TARC and is the team lead for the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System and leads or supports the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center Technical Assistance and Evaluation Projects. Before joining the WRMA, Mr. Urban had a 25-year career in Texas state government, including serving as a director and assistant commissioner in the Adult Protective Services Program. Prior to APS, Mr. Urban worked on aging and disability issues, including serving as manager of policy analysis and support at the Texas Department of Aging and Disability Services, deputy director at the Texas State Department on Aging, and as a member of the Texas Council on Developmental Disabilities, Statewide Health Coordinating Council, and Governor's Advisory Council on Physical Fitness. He has a BA degree in government from Abilene Christian University, 
and an MA in Public Affairs from the LBJ School at the University of Texas at Austin. Our second speaker today is Jason Wagner. Jason is a senior business analyst with WRMA Incorporated and a graduate of Arizona State University. He started his career in the Aging Network as a benefits counselor at the Area on Aging in Austin, Texas. Subsequently, he has managed two area agencies on aging, an aging and disability resource center, and worked for the state unit on aging in Texas. He has volunteered as a long-term care ombudsman in his free time and currently supports two ACL data projects, the Aging, Independence, and Disability Program Data Portal, and other, and the Older Americans Act Performance System. Andy, next slide, please. And Carl and Jason, I'm going to hand things over to you. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, so welcome from Texas, where both Jason and I are. It's 1,002 degrees here this afternoon. Uh, but we are looking forward to telling you all a little bit about the aging network and our perspective on it and what we think are some critical intersections with what we do in APS as well. Andy, please, next slide. So just to give y'all an overview of what we are gonna talk about today, um, we, wanna, we wanna communicate how the aging network is a valuable resource for APS. Mission is a little different. Many things are the same though. And so what we wanna do is talk about the organization, uh, the services and the overall system and the system roles that it has. And then at the end, maybe talk a little bit about so what, some of the key takeaways, some of the connections that we think we want to make with uh, APS folks and the aging network folks. So let me tell you how we're going to do this. We took a kind of a standard uh, AOA, Administration on Aging 101 slide deck, and are basically using it. Um, and, and added a few things in there about where we think the connections are really important, point them out to you literally in purple. I don't know why I chose purple, uh, with big bright arrows pointing to them. Uh, we did add a few slides of our own along the way. Uh, so just so you'll pay attention, you can try to figure out which slides were the AOA slides and which slides were the ones that we added. So Andy, slide next, please. Um, let's do a poll real quick so that we know, uh, get some perspective on, on what y'all's current relationship is. So how frequently do you work with the area agency on aging in your community, or if you're a state person, the state unit on, uh, aging every day, once a week, once a month, uh, what's the aging network if you don't ever do it would be your responses. So we'll give y'all a little bit. And you know, I'll just I'll do that little talk while we're waiting for you to fill out the poll kind of stuff that's meaningless instead of leaving the dead air. Andy, how's the poll going? The poll is going great. We have about it's going great. We're good. Well, 33 percent, 37 percent. It's grown by the second. So um, growing. Oh, every second it's growing. Well, that's good. Um, Ten more seconds or so, you get about half the folks replying. And well, I think we managed to talk the entire time. The poll was going <laughs> without good. playing Jeopardy music just to entertain people. That's good. So why don't I go ahead and close it out for us since we got the majority? Of I'm questions. running out of things to say. Yeah, me too. So <laughs> here you go. Results. <laughs> All right. So, oh, look at this pretty evenly split. So we've got every day, uh, I'm guessing that's folks in local communities, once a week is at 13%, once a month is 32%, and what's the aging network? So there's a few folks here um, at 24%. So we, we have tried to design um, the content here for kind of all the odd, knowing that we would have diversity in the audience. So uh, we'll try to give you some, some detailed stuff for those of you that are the everyday folks and some background stuff for those of you uh, that are the what's the aging network folks. And with that, on the next slide, I'm going to turn it over to Jason to get us started talking about ACL. Great. Thanks, Carl. So let's start with a little background about ACL for those of you that aren't familiar. Uh, ACL was formed in 2012 by combining agencies with similar missions, the Administration on Aging, the Office on Disability, and the Administration on Developmental Disabilities. 
Well, the Administration on Aging is the principal agency responsible for carrying out the provisions of the Older Americans Act of 1965. That's where most of the funding comes from for the aging network. The Older Americans Act empowers the federal government to distribute funds to the states for supportive services for individuals over the age of 60 and other various programs that have been added over the years. So what is ACL's fundamental principle? It is older adults and people of all ages with disabilities should be able to live where they choose, with the people they choose, and with the ability to participate fully in their communities. And that principle helps guide a wide range of social services and programs. And I think you'll find that we're going to have a lot of overlap here with APS and the Aging Network. And I'm really glad to see so many folks work with the Aging Network already on a, on a weekly basis. I'm going to pass it over to Carl for the next slide. So here's, here's the organizational chart for ACL. Um, one thing that we don't have accurate on here, I remembered, is we got an email a, a couple of days ago about the exact title of Allison Barkoff at the top. The exact title of Allison Barkoff is the senior official performing the duties of the administrator and the assistant secretary on aging. So under the Older Americans Act, there is a administrator on aging. Um, that's designated in statute and then there but that person also performs the role as the head of the overall agency for the administration for community living and uh, right now Allison is acting because there's not been a statutorily appointed um, administrator for aging. Uh, as you look at this chart there are kind of three key chunks that are important. Uh, there is the there's kind of the aging programs piece that's under the administration on aging to the far left there under Edwin Walker. There are the disability programs. Uh, so you see the administration on disabilities and the National Institute on Disability. Um, those are good partners to know about, but we're not gonna talk about them today in terms of some of the programs that uh, ACL administers. And then there's that box down in the bottom center of uh, regional operations. That's how the administration for uh, uh, that's how the administration on aging programs are actually administered through this regional operations. And we'll talk about that next. Uh, from an APS perspective, the box we probably care about the most is the AOA box. Uh, that's where the Office of Elder Abuse and APS is that where you work very closely with. Uh, so closely, in fact, that they actually fund what we do. Uh, next slide, please, Andy. So, uh, ACL administers the Older Americans Act programs through the regional offices that you see here. Um, and the next couple of slides, Andy, have the, the regional administrators and tell you, next slide, Andy, please, tell you the, the, exact states that are in each region. Uh, for you state APS people, uh, this is particularly important. Uh, there are times that, and, and you may remember some of this, there are times that ACL, through some of the work that they do with APS, will want the regional administrator, if not involved, at least aware of what is going on. So these folks are kind of important. Uh, so next slide, Andy, to get the complete list, and then let's go on to slide 15. All right, so administration on aging. Uh, as, as Jason mentioned a minute ago, um, it was created back in 1965, um, and there were three programs. Uh, Medicaid, Medicare are these huge monolithic programs. Uh, but anybody that works with Medicaid and Medicare know that people fall through the cracks, there are gaps in the coverage, and understanding and navigating those systems of care are very difficult. And so at the same time, they had the wisdom for Older Americans to create the Older Americans Act. Uh, the Older Americans Act is intended in part to kind of solve some of those problems, to fill in some of those gaps, to help people navigate through the systems of care that were created by the other two programs. Next slide, please, Andy. So this next slide is um, 
one that shows you how the APS programs around the country relate to the aging network. Uh, uh, it, it, it's kind of it's a cross between how are APS uh, investigations conducted? Are they conducted at the state level by state employees? Or are they conducted by by local employees cross-referenced with, okay, within state government, where is the APS program located? Uh, and so if you look at the first row, um, this is where is APS located at the state government. You can see uh, that there are 20 programs, 20 APS programs, 20 out of the 54 are located in the same agency within state government as the state unit on aging. So your neighbors within the bureaucracy. That doesn't, how the organizational structure works beyond that varies very much from state to state to state. And so within those 20 programs, you can see the breakout between how many are state run programs, how many are locally run programs, uh, where they're locally run programs. Those are generally county based programs. APS programs are not administered through the aging network. I am only aware of one state where the APS network, where the APS, per, where the aging network through the area agencies on aging has some sort of oversight over the APS program. They are partners at the local level. They are not co-administered at the local level uh, almost entirely across the country. So next slide, and Jason's gonna tell you about the Older Americans Act. Thanks, Carl. So the Older Americans Act statutory language contains the following seven titles, <clears throat> which are summarized here. But we've highlighted the titles most commonly recognized or utilized based on services provided. And what you'll see here is Title 3B, C, D, and E, Title 6, which is similar types of programs as Title 3, but for Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiian Elders. And then Title VII also houses the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, which many of you are probably familiar with, um, consists of ombudsmen and volunteer ombudsmen who advocate for the health, the safety, the rights, uh, welfare of individuals who live in long-term care facilities. So those are like nursing homes, uh, board and care, and other residential care communities. Uh, next slide, please. And, and so we put together a little, another little poll for you. Uh, Andy, if you'd launch the poll, and since those of you, I mean, at least half of you already work with the Aging Network, we wanted to know who you are working with. Uh, I, and so this is a please select all that apply poll. So are you working with the long-term care ombudsman on advocacy for nursing facility residents? Are you working with the Title III nutrition program? Uh, which would be home delivered meals and congregate meals? Um, are you helping to arrange in home and social support services like adult daycare? Are you trying to find support for caregivers of some of your clients? And then are you accessing some of the system navigation stuff that the aging network does? And Andy, how's our vote going? We'll see, we got about 17% of the folks. Let's give it another 15 seconds or so. All right, so uh, we are curious to see how y'all actually work. And recall, you can vote for all that apply in this particular case. Give it about five more seconds, and then I'll close it out and share the results. All right, and then the results should be up on your screen, Carl. Go. Clearly does not total to 100% when you check all that apply, uh, but... Uh, it's the access and assistance programs are used the most. Um, I guess that does not surprise me. Uh, and then everything else is pretty close after that. So what we're going to do now is we are going to kind of run through and explain all these programs and how this service structure works within the Older Americans Act and take it away, Jason. Thanks, Carl. So this diagram here demonstrates the aging network top to bottom from the federal level, AOA is the administration on aging, uh, down to the local level. So that gets all the way down to the volunteer level. Uh, the aging services network provides a range of community-based services, which it appears many of you are familiar with, your home delivered meals, congregate nutrition, case management, transportation, INA, et cetera. 
Uh, and these services are intended to reach the most vulnerable older adults with the greatest social and economic need. So from here, you can see you start at AOA and then we move down to the grantees of AOA. So this is who AOA contracts with and it's 56 state units um, and uh, regional areas and then 282 tribal organizations. And that typically covers the Title VI funding streams. And then those folks contract or work through their state unit on aging with the area agencies on aging. And then if you're familiar with the area agencies on aging, they contract out with many service providers, hundreds of thousands of volunteers to provide all of these supports that you see down in the bottom that meet one in five or touch one in five uh, of C one in five of the seniors in the US. Uh, and that's about 11 million. I mean, just looking at the number of meals, 358 million meals, 24 million rides, et cetera, really shows the breadth um, of the network that, that the aging network serves. Uh, next slide, please. So a couple points about the Older Americans Act to make. Um, unlike Medicaid, it's not means tested and is available to older adults, but with an emphasis on those with the greatest social and economic need. Because of this, the benefit is it's much more flexible. It's a more flexible system to meet the regional and local needs. And for some of the programs, eligibility information is not even required. Though screening for the need is really an important part of uh, what a lot of the providers do. Next slide, please. So who do we serve? Generally speaking, the aging network serves anyone age 60 years or older and those with disabilities. However, a greater need exists, again, for the more vulnerable populations. And in the case of some of the other programs, like caregiver, there are some uh, varying, varying age uh, uh, allowances uh, that are allowed to be met. This particular slide shows some statistics of the population served, which probably look very familiar to those of you on the call. And if you're not familiar with what ADL and IADL stands for, uh, they represent the activities or the instrumental activities of daily living. So things such as walking, feeding, bathing, uh, to uh, other items such as managing finances, house cleaning, meal prep, and managing medications, uh, just to name a few. Uh, as you can see, there's some obvious overlap here with the APS population that's served. Next slide, please. So home and community-based services. Um, the next nine slides provide insights regarding key service data. So for those of you that are familiar with the services, you'll see some interesting uh, statistics about those services. And for those of you that are not familiar with the services, I'll talk a little bit about each one and we have some definitions later on in the, the slide deck. So HCBS or home and community-based services refers to services and supports that are provided to consumers in their homes or offered in the community including items such as home delivered meals, home health care, homemaker, chore services, transportation, caregiver support services, and, and much, much more. Um, part of ACL's mission is to collaborate with other community partners. One of those examples here on this slide is the collaboration with the HCBS Business Acumen Center, which promotes the development of business relationships between payers and providers of integrated health services. So those are folks such as managed care organizations, uh, accountable care organizations, hospitals, clinics, uh, CBOs, known as community-based uh, organizations, um, who help people, help, help keep people happy and healthy in the community. And over the last few years, the Biden administration has highlighted the importance of the human services infrastructure. Next slide. This is an example of transportation. Uh, it's one of the services that tends to have a significant impact on the population served within the aging network and the ability for individuals uh, to get to and from daily activities such as doctor's appointments or grocery store, et cetera, plays a major role in keeping folks in their home, which is one of the primary goals of the aging network so folks can stay in their home, age in place and, and not be moved out where we tend to see uh, problematic occurrences occur, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Next slide, please. Another critical service that is part of the aging network is nutrition services. It includes congregate meals, home delivered meals, and other nutrition programs that serve the population. The nutrition services use a formula grant process to fund the meal programs. So the formula takes into account the US population over 60, and that determines the state's share 
of the available funds for those particular programs. And there are some other programs, uh, NCEP, we, we call it NCEP, it's Nutrition Services Incentive Program. Uh, that fund is based on the entity's percentage of the total number of meals served in the prior federal fiscal year. So these are just some examples of how funding is accounted for and provided to uh, the various uh, entities uh, up and down the aging network. Next slide, please. And here are some more uh, statistics uh, showing how nutrition really is a critical component to remain in the community. Um, one of the nice things is these congregate meals or home delivered meals uh, are provided uh, as a reference um, and follow the dietary guidelines uh, for Americans, which is really nice because a lot of times folks don't even understand what they should be eating once they've uh, been brought into the aging network. And this really helps to uh, promote uh, that capacity. Next slide, please. And here are some more statistics uh, about the number of meals served, which I find is staggering sometimes when you think about it. 90% uh, of the clients report that the program has helped them stay in their own home. So you look at the number of people here that have been served, and you think about the fact that 90% of them are saying, without it, I may not be able to stay in my home, is a testament to how important the congregate home delivered uh, nutrition programs really are uh, to the folks that we serve. Next slide, please. Caregivers. So as you can see here, the <clears throat> Aging Network serves about 715,000 caregivers annually. The National Family Caregiver Support Program provides grants to states and territories to fund various supports that help family and informal caregivers care for older adults in their home for as long as possible. Really, the unsung heroes is part of the network, if you think about it. Um, grantees provide five types of services for the caregivers information to caregivers about available services, assistance to caregivers and gaining access to the services, individual counseling and the organization of support groups and caregiver training, respite care for those caregivers, give them a break from their, their activities and caring for the older individuals, and supplemental services on a limited basis. Eligibility is a bit different from, for, from the non-care caregiver programs where if you're 18 or older caring for somebody 60 plus or somebody with Alzheimer's, you can receive services. And then older relatives, we call it the grandparents program, um, who are age 55 caring for children under 18 or somebody who's 18 to 59 with a disability uh, are eligible. Next slide, please. So some more statistics for you to take a look at about the importance of caregivers caring for the aging population. I'm sure many of us on this call have been or currently are or probably will be caregivers in the near future or at some point. Uh, some examples of some of the uh, programs that are part of the caregiver um, network is the RAISE Family Caregivers Act, which became law on January 2nd, 2018. And it directs uh, HHS to develop a national family caregiving strategy. So what it's trying to do is promote greater adoption of person and family centered care. So rather than just focusing on providing people services, how do we get the family to participate in what needs to be done to care for this? And that's both healthcare and long-term service settings. Uh, the assessment and service planning, including care transitions and coordination involving care recipients and family caregivers additional information, education, and training supports, more respite options, and financial security uh, and other workplace-related issues. Next slide, please. So now we'll move away from Title III and we'll talk a little bit more about Title VI from the original slide that we went into. So Title VI is very similar to Title III as far as the programs that are provided, but the contracting mechanism is a little different and it's directed solely at the Native Americans and Native Hawaiian populations. Um, in this case, the formula that funds uh, the tribal organizations allocates based on their share of the population age 60 and over in their service area. Um, and a lot of times that population is referred to as the elders. Uh, the program is also very responsive and respectful to the cultural attributes of these communities. Next slide, please. 
And as you can see, it's, it's many of the same types of programs that we just reviewed for Title III, uh, congregate home delivered meals, information and referral, transportation. Then it also has caregiver support programs uh, that assist families and grandparents caring for grandchildren uh, and services that re reach <clears throat> meet a range of caregivers' needs. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back to Carl. Next slide, please. So that's that's sort of the meat of what happens under the Older Americans Act in the Aging Network in terms of all of the services that they provide. Uh, we thought it would be interesting as a point of comparison to look at okay, well, what does what does APS do? Um, and so this is a slide from our about to be published evaluation in which we ask the question, how does APS provide services by individual service? And so you see a long list of services there down, down the, the left-hand side of the axis. And then you see three different blocks on how those services are provided. In the first block, it's provided directly by APS staff. In the purple block, it's provided by APS purchasing the service. And then the third block, the blue block, is APS is referring people um, for services for this particular service. So two, two key things to point out here, I think. Um, when you look at this array of services, uh, the lowest one on here at 36 programs is money management. Uh, Clearly, APS is in the business of uh, their clients needing a wide array of services. The second thing that's interesting about this is that the blue mechanism, the referred by APS mechanism, is by far the predominant mechanism that APS uses for most services. Given the overlap in services between what the aging network does and the fact that APS is usually referring clients, I think the connection is fairly obvious. And with that, I'll let Jason talk about uh, long-term care ombudsman. Next slide, Andy. Thanks, Carl. So the long-term care ombudsman uh, program, as stated earlier, is part of Title VII, which consists of ombudsmen and volunteer ombudsmen who advocate for individuals who live in long-term care settings and other, other residential care communities. Um, one key point about ombudsmen is they don't conduct an investigation, but rather report or refer as needed. So I would imagine some of you probably work closely with the LTCO programs uh, as part of the state or as part of the AAA, since they tend to be the first to lay eyes on situations that may occur uh, within long-term care uh, facility settings. Uh, so these are just some more statistics that you can take a look at. Um, it's pretty interesting to see how many visits and how many volunteers are part of the long-term care ombudsman. There, it's, it's, you know, almost one to seven, uh, the number of volunteers to the number of professional ombudsmen. And I can tell you as a volunteer myself in the past, um, the professional ombudsmen are just that. They're extremely professional and they really take their job seriously. And I can't imagine what would happen to a lot of these folks if they didn't have them there to advocate for them when nobody else is there for them. Uh, so I'm gonna pass it back to Carl for a slide. Next slide, please. So protection of vulnerable elders under Title VII in, in the Older Americans Act. Um, the, the key point here is that the Administration for Community Living through AOA under the Older Americans Act has had protection of vulnerable elders as a responsibility for a long time. This is not something that is new for them. Um, and so you can see that they have been doing this advocacy and this work in a number of different areas, whether it's implementation of the Elder Justice Act, they now do the Elder Justice Coordinating Council, they fund the National Center on Elder Abuse, uh, they've established the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System, the APS Consensus Guidelines for UA. APS folks, um, these are things that y'all are um, all familiar with. Uh, and so when they established the Office of Elder Justice and APS, it fit pretty well in with this mission that they already had related to protection of vulnerable elders. Jason, 
uh, talk a little bit about legal services in this regard. Yeah, legal services. This is uh, probably an underused APS resource, um, but for those of you that do use it, probably realize just how beneficial it is. So as you can see here, legal services provided 933,000 hours of legal assistance last year. But what, what does legal, legal assistance uh, encompass? So we have some of the top areas listed here. Um, it helps people access public benefits. So SSI, SSDI, Medicaid, Medicare, veterans benefits, unemployment compensation, et cetera. Uh, if they have benefits counselors or uh, attorneys on staff, they can draft advanced directives, designate surrogate decision makers who will effectuate older adults' wishes if they become incapacitated. Um, issues related to guardianship with a focus on representation are provided access to available housing options, including low-income housing programs um, that allow independence in homes and communities. That's a big one uh, over the years I've seen. Um, foreclosure or eviction proceedings that jeopardize the ability for folks to stay independent. Um, that's also another one that I've found has been very uh, helpful to folks, especially those who may have become confused with their finances or have another extenuating circumstance that has caused problems. Um, some other items, uh, gaining access to long-term care, private financing options, and then more importantly, elder abuse, including consumer fraud and financial exploitation of older persons. That's been a, a consistent theme I've seen across um, the, the board of folks that have been exploited in some way once they've uh, reached a certain point um, in their life. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back to Carl. Next slide, please. So we wanna shift the focus a little bit here. Um, up to now, we've been talking about services, uh, and, and y'all recall back when I was talking about Medicaid, Medicare, and the establishment of the Older Americans Act, there's gaps, and, and there's the need to figure out how to navigate these very complex human services, healthcare systems that we have. And so this is a picture that's worth a thousand words uh, that talks about just looking at the world of long-term services and supports how confusing that is. I remember my days in state government, we, it's like you're literally trying to solve the puzzle. So that is a, um, a very good metaphor or analogy to use for this. You've got clients that are trying to access long-term services and supports, and you've got to figure out what they qualify for uh, and how do we get them hooked up with the right services. And so uh, this is something that AOA through the aging network and through some of its grant funding is trying to solve. Jason will tell you about ADRCs and one mechanism for doing that. Next slide, Andy. Okay, so ADRCs. Some of you may be familiar with ADRCs. So what are ADRCs? Well, the common description is aging and disability resource centers that are highly visible and trusted places where people of all ages incomes and disabilities can go to get information and one-on-one -on -one counseling on the full range of long-term services and supports that are available. It was launched back in 2003 as a collaborative effort and basically they're meant to help streamline access to long-term services and supports and help navigate that spaghetti puzzle that Carl uh, just showed. Um, and a lot of times that can be done in person. Uh, ADRCs, though, depending on region, may provide easy access to the information with one-on-one -on -one options counseling, is what they call it, or resources and services that support the needs of family caregivers. So far, six states have passed ADRC's single point of entry legislation, le legislation. so it's, it's still relatively in its infancy. Um, 17 states have received state funding to support ADRC pilot sites in about 24 ADRC grantee states report uh, pursuing or have already received private grants to support their efforts at the state or local level. Um, and it's important to note that nearly two thirds of AAAs or air, uh, area agencies on aging perform the ADRC functions within their communities. Next slide, please. So, uh, <laughs> without looking at the spaghetti mess, uh, here's, here's the, it, you can see how AAAs often act as a hub of the aging network's comprehensive and coordinated service delivery system. 
So including their connection with APS here, you can see highlighted down there to the bottom right. And I'm sure folks on the call may already be coordinating with their local AAAs, uh, but hopefully this slide helps generate some ideas about how AAAs and the aging network can help support APS's mission and vice versa, um, and show just how integral a AAA can be to connecting uh, the population to those services and supports. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the next four slides, we're not gonna go through these in detail. We provided these next four slides so that you can get an idea of all the services as well as a little bit more description about each of those services that may exist within your area. But it's really important to connect with your local AAA to ascertain the specific programs available in your region. Because not all AAAs will provide all of the programs that you see listed here today. And in some cases, they provide additional programs that aren't necessarily listed here. Uh, so go ahead and go to the next slide and everybody can just take a look at the different services. We have home health services, home repair, Home modification, that's one that a lot of people don't realize is available sometimes. Sometimes to stay in a home, someone needs a ramp because they have a set of steps. And a lot of times there are programs that exist that can help folks with that. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Long-term care ombudsman program, nutrition, personal care, respite, uh, et cetera. So these slides are really references for you to be able to go back and look at this. And then if you want to uh, go back and talk to your AAA and say, hey, do you provide any of these? Or maybe you're already using some of these and there are some additional services that you could take advantage of. Uh, that's the goal of these slides. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Senior center programs, that's a big one, depending on, you, on your region or where you work. Some of the senior centers provide a lot of great uh, resources, as well as they have a lot of services within the senior center too. It just depends on the region. And a lot of times the AAA will have that knowledge um, to pass to you. So maybe you've called them many times, but you've never asked them about the senior centers in the area, and they could actually provide you more information about which senior centers in the area provide which services and what might be helpful to some of the folks that you're serving. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're shifting gears a little bit here. This is the National Elder Care Locator. Uh, it's another resource that can help folks out, uh, including yourselves. Uh, the Elder Care Locator is a nationwide service that connects older Americans and their caregivers with local support resources. Uh, and one can search for those resources uh, online or they can actually call the 1-800 number and speak to an information specialist uh, that's local. So if you're someone that hasn't already connected with your AAA, this is one way that funnels people to the appropriate AAA uh, or support services in their area. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Carl now. Next slide, please. So that's the services, that's the process um, that the aging network is providing. Uh, we thought it important to point out that there are some common values uh, between the aging network and APS. Um, and, and these three terms here uh, capture them pretty well. They, they are all terms that APS programs are familiar with, and they are all terms that aging network programs are familiar with. Maybe, maybe they mean different things slightly in different contexts to different programs, um, but the values that they represent, I think, are well understood and they are shared uh, between what the APS programs do and what the, what the uh, aging network programs do. Uh, they are very focused on the client consumer needs and client and consumer decisions and even in the case of the older Americans Act program, so you can say self-direction beyond self-determination. Um, in APS world, we are all familiar with the fact that uh, determining capacity so that we can understand client decision-making capabilities is a critical part of what we do. Um, how we plan services within APS, uh, according to the data that we've seen from our own survey, is very much centered on what the individual needs, what the individual wants, 
it is the same sort of mechanism within the case management and information and assistance services that the aging network provides. And then in both cases, uh, the, the focus is ideally on community-based in-home services, services in the least restrictive uh, environment that is possible to meet individual needs. Uh, and so both sets of programs are focused on trying to deliver services in those types of environments. So next slide, please. Um, and the goal then of all of these values is aging in place. Uh, it, is, it is a very explicit goal for the Older Americans Act program. It is a very implicit goal uh, within the APS programs, um, and that's trying to invest in those core and home community-based services that help people stay at home. Uh, you know, building a network is part of what was intended under the Older Americans Act. There is this system development aspect to what they are trying to do to build the network that allows aging in place. Uh, so that's funding the services, that's building the partnerships, uh, that's developing the resources at the local level that go into those partnerships. Um, and then it's focused on innovation and it's a focus on effective outcomes and, and trying to build for the future a network that is in place to help seniors age in place. Next slide, Andy. Um, this, this was one of the AOA slides, uh, and these are their words. It, and their key challenges are rapidly increasing demographics, increasing complexity and needs of individuals and families, referrals by the healthcare sector without sharing in the costs of care. If I sat in a room with APS staff and I asked them what challenges there were, I am certainly going to hear those first two items. Um, the APS relationship with the healthcare sector is not quite the same as it is with the aging network, but even then, that relationship is critical in terms of working together. So some of the, the key challenges that the aging network has identified, I think, overlap a lot with the challenges that we face in APS. So the next slide summarizes then what we think are some of the key takeaways um, from all of this. So building on what I just said, the aging network has an advocacy and a network building focus that makes them a key partner in local communities. APS programs would not be successful in local communities without that network that, that is being built under the Older Americans Act. Um, APS, conversely, has a protection function that the aging network does. They have, aging network has an advocacy function as it relates to vulnerable adults, but they do not have a protection function. This is where APS is the valuable partner for the aging network when they come across situations uh, which an investigation in which the maltreatment types are of a different nature than the aging network um, is set up to deal with. So you've got these slight differences in mission um, between the two, but the reality is that the APS and the aging network serve similar populations with similar needs in the same communities. That makes it critical that they work together. So Jason will give you a few points on how that works. So number one is build a professional relationship with your local AAA staff. I've seen in the past, um, AAAs and APS doing in-service training with staff, um, meet and greets with the staff, et cetera. And then also that would give you access to the AAA contractor base through a, a formal relationship potentially, um, or an informal working together to find services in the community and sharing that information with each other. Um, and then another one that I thought was really important and, I, and I've seen work really well in some of the areas that I've, I've practiced is get to know and contact the AAA case managers, benefits counselors, and ombudsmen directly. If you have a direct line to these folks, a lot of times you can solve problems pretty quick and vice versa. A lot of times they can head off a problem before it becomes uh, a real issue. 
So I've found that that's been uh, really beneficial over the years. Um, and then advocating as part of the aging network planning process. So the aging network and the AAAs go through planning processes where they do regional plans and they talk about what they're going to be implementing in their community. They make decisions about which services they're going to fund more than others. So you only have a finite amount of funding uh, to provide in your area. And when they're doing their area plan, they need to know where are the critical needs uh, that need to be met because typically all services are being used at all times. There's very rarely ever a, a moment in time where AAA is unable to use up all its money. It's, it's usually always how much can I put towards one thing or the other. And then having that connection with the AAA and advocating on behalf of certain things or informing them of what you've seen out uh, in, in your work uh, is a helpful um, aspect of that network planning process. Um, and I've seen, you know, just as an example, I had one come across not too long ago, and I know I talked about it with the group here um, that's helping with this presentation, is folks that are isolated uh, and they have no one visiting them, but maybe they have a pet. We found that hiring a dog walker to go walk their dog once a week is a great way to just check in on somebody and make sure everything's okay versus having to expend resources from uh, a worker to go out and, and do that. So there's a lot of unique examples that you could potentially borrow from the AAA that I've seen over the years. And with that, Carl. So, you know, and, and the example I would give is I remember my conversations with, with Ron DePogue. Uh, I doubt anybody on this webinar knows Ron DePogue. Ron DePogue was the AAA director in Wichita Falls, Texas for a long time. Uh, Wichita Falls is not the biggest, richest community in the world. And I just remember having conversations with her about how she uh, works with APS. And she said, you know, they would even go so far as they'd get their case manager together with the APS staff. They'd each figure out what kind of resources they have in place. And they would basically share responsibility for uh, trying to take care of the needs of the individual uh, that met the protection uh, aspects of the, old, of, the, of the APS mission, but yet at the same time met the mission uh, of the aging network to help that individual in place. Um, so the opportunities for partnership and working together um, are there and they need to be taken advantage of on a case-by-case -case basis because what you get in the aging network and in the APS program is highly complementary, and, and you should be working together with them as a critical partner. So next slide um, is just a, a slide to give you some sense from the ACL website um, about what type of information is available on the aging network. If you need more information, um, you can go there and get that information. And at this point, next slide, Andy, we would be glad to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Jason and Carl. Really, really good information. Uh, something that really stood out to me was that 85% of those receiving care from a caregiver uh, would be at risk uh, at nursing home placements if it weren't for that caregiver. That uh, number is, is really speaks volumes. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out too, Jason, I really enjoyed how you talked about the dog walker. Uh, I remember, for those of you who are on, uh, I did APS investigations for about 12 years, and I remember using Meals on Wheels, uh, whether the client really needed or not, as, you know, a knock on the door to kind of check in on them. So thank you for that. All right, so I'm going to open it up to questions right now. I do have one. Uh, this person says that they're a new APS professional, and they want to know regarding the services on the four slides, so the services that's provided. Are all of these services provided in or available in every part of the United States? So who would like to take that one? I can take that one. Yeah, so unfortunately, no, um, it, it varies by region. So those are the services. There's a primary core set of services that need to be provided, a lot of the meal programs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But as a state develops their, their planning for how services will be provided, and then that's provided to the AAAs, the AAAs determine which services uh, they're going to provide in their area. So it's, that's why we say it's so important to connect with your local AAA to find out exactly what services they're providing. And maybe they do provide that service but maybe they don't have very much funding and you end up with a waiting list that could be a year or more long 
for someone to get a service. And, and an example of that is, I think I touched on it, was ramp building. I know there was a time where a, to get a ramp built, you had to wait at least a year or two for funds to become available. But that varies by region. So it's it's really important to connect with the local AAA. And just like Carl had pointed out, where APS and the AAA director had met and reviewed all their resources to provide those services to those individuals. That's, that's really uh, the best use case I can think of. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. So uh, it says, were there any major changes in the proposed rules that just closed on the 15th that would impact anything that you presented on today? Uh, did either of you able to answer that question? Oh, I have a very clear and succinct answer to that question, which is, I don't know. Okay. Um, all right. As Andy will tell you, we have discussed that we need to read those rules and we have not read those rules yet. Um, okay. My guess is the answer to that is no. Um, the, the, the stuff that we have discussed today is kind of the core foundational stuff gotcha. within the network. And I doubt that they've proposed any rule changes that would change any of that. But that's a great question. And um, and, 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 and as I said, Andy and I have already talked about the fact that as, it, as this rule process goes along in the end, when the rules get adopted, we certainly need to look at them and see if they have, see what changes are finally adopted that APS programs may need to know about. So that's something for us to, to work on in the future. Okay. Now, one final last quick question. Is there a website that houses all of these services so they can be accessed directly? Hey, Jason, you know the answer to that? I do not know the answer to no, that. You, you can review the definitions from ACL's site. If you, if you start looking at Older Americans Act, it will define all of this. But what, again, I would have to defer back to the local AAA. Some AAAs maintain very robust websites that talk about everything they do. Some states maintain very robust websites that talk about all the services they provide. But in the end, I know sometimes that stuff doesn't get updated frequently. And the best way to know what's going on is to connect with those managing these programs. So whether you talk to the manager of the ADRC, or you connect with some of the caseworkers or the case managers or the director, um, of your regional AAA, whoever's serving your area, that's the, the finite way to determine just how much um, resources are available that you can tap into. And, and I'll tell you, for the most part, folks that run AAAs, they're really great people. So I'm sure you're gonna love meeting them if you haven't met them already. You know, it, it, this circles back to the first question that was asked about services in the local community. And, and as Jason explained, it's a very distributed system and they want local planning to determine local needs. Um, and if there's an ADRC in your community, they probably have a pretty good website with what's available in the community. And then it's just going to be, you need to look up your local area agency on aging or your state unit on aging and see what kind of website they have with information on the services that they provide. All right. Thank you so much, Carl and Jason. Uh, Andy, next slide, please. So on behalf of APS Stark, I just wanna thank our presenters today, both Carl Urban and Jason, for giving this great presentation on uh, Intro to the Aging Network. Uh, we're here to help you in any way we can. Just reach out to us using the contact information on this screen. Uh, we're here to support you and enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on the use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies and providing individualized technical assistance to APS programs. I also wanna give you a friendly reminder to please, please, please uh, complete the evaluation. We really like to know your thoughts and uh, you know your points of view. So we wanna thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your day for your own professional development and for all the work that you do to keep the older and dependent adult community free from abuse, neglect and exploitation. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.